They're coming to get you, Barbara. Welcome to another edition of Shrek Talk. Uh, tonight, we're, our main topic we're going to be discussing is pretty popular. Uh, I think everybody's familiar with it if you live in America for the most part um, and other parts of the world. It's the Marvel Cinematic Universe, the Phase 1 series of films, which encompasses everything from Iron Man all the way through the Avengers, um, just the ones that are directly produced by um, Marvel and fit in with the Avengers quote unquote universe. Um, what are your thoughts on the films before we get into them too much? The whole franchise as a whole, just a quick thought. Well, I'm I'm more of a DC fan than I am a Marvel fan. Uh, I've watched you know all of these movies. I haven't really seen anything from Phase Two yet, uh, post Avengers. Uh, and I I was kind of thinking about this beforehand that I'm not really in sync with most of the movie going community when it comes to movies in general, and even more so on superhero movies. Uh, so you're gonna probably find movies in this series that I like that weren't as popular as what the common conception of people are. Um, I kind of disagree, but that's why we're doing this podcast because my views don't really always go with everybody else's and I'd like to get my opinion out there. Uh, Well, quick note, you actually are quite familiar with it. You've seen um, two of the four films that are out so far for the second phase, which would be Iron Man 3 um, and the Thor Dark World. That is right. Uh, I, I forgot about those ones. Yeah, you, all you need left to see um, to finish it off before Avengers would be the Guardians of the Galaxy, which we've mentioned previously. And um, I need to see Winter Soldier. Winter Soldier as well. That's the other one, which I was trying to convince you to watch today, but you know we'll get around to it eventually. Um, but moving on to our topic, let, let's start in. We're just going to go each film, discuss each film a little bit, uh, maybe stick on the ones we like a little bit more, a little longer, maybe maybe not. We'll, we'll see. Um, the first film is pretty popular. It obviously started it all. Um, that was The Iron Man, uh, directed by John Favreau. It came out in 2008, um, May 2008. It was a smash hit. I, I, was work- I remember working and seeing, uh, being surprised by how many people came out. Um, it, was just, it was this phenomenon, kind of. It surprised everybody. It blindsided them. And it really put a stamp on Marvel. There was their first feature film that they produced by themselves without another studio. And it, it landed them. It, it took off in record fashion. I think it's still the fourth or fifth highest grossing um, Marvel film out there. So it's, it definitely you know made an impact. And obviously we've had three Iron Man movies. The, the character is quite iconic. He was the highest paid of the actors in the entire franchise. Still is the highest paid actor in the franchise. And personally, I don't, I don't have that much love for the film. I, I think it's, it's okay. It's not amazing. But there's a lot of flaws in it and a lot of good things. Before we delve into the the finer points, your thoughts? Well, uh, and I'll kind of continue on with the finer points, but uh, yeah, I'm not a big fan of Iron Man either. And it's not so much Robert Downey Jr. Um, I I think he does a great job of acting like Tony Stark. My issue with it is I don't like the character of Tony Stark. I think that's supposed to be the point, and for me, that's actually a turnoff. I know that that was one of the points when it was written as a comic character, was they wanted to create an unlikable character that was still a hero and still had a good thing, but um, I think the way he acts doesn't really reflect what I think a of as as a hero and you know these characters are supposed to I mean these are the characters that kids look up to these are the characters adults look up to even in some ways we aspire to be these people and that's not someone I think anyone should aspire to be yeah and I really have a problem with um, just kind of overviewing this whole series real quick uh, the popularity of Iron Man and how everybody loves the Iron Man character and you know it's so great and so awesome and whereas I prefer Captain America as a character you know, staying true to my kind of Superman love and stuff like that. I like my heroes to be heroes. And the character that uh, it makes me sad kind of about society that of the uh, all the Avengers, Iron Man is the most popular and he's the biggest jerk and, uh, you know, that of, the, of them all. Yet Captain America gets no love. Yeah, and when we go into two Avengers, I definitely think that's something that we're heavily going to discuss um, because I, I feel quite similar on that topic about the comparison between those two. But yeah, I got to agree. As a character, Tony Stark is not a, not to my taste at all. And uh, you know, the movie wasn't bad. It really didn't do anything for me. You had Jeff Bridges as the bad guy in it. I don't remember his name. 
Oh, uh, it's we're throw. Uh, he's a throwaway villain, not a good villain at all. Uh, Gwyneth Paltrow is really the only one that ended up in the Avengers of the female leads from the movies. I will say that Pepper Potts is definitely one of the the best thing to come out of the Iron Man films, in my opinion. Is Pepper Potts? I really like the character and the way she's portrayed. I think Gwyneth Paltrow classes up the film and classes up the franchise as a whole. And uh, was it? Uh, Don Cheadle? No, Don Cheadle. Don Cheadle would, would replace him. It was um, Terrence Howard in the Terrence first Howard, movie. Terrence Howard, that's right, uh, in the first movie. Um, so it was a really good cast. Like I said, I, I like Robert Downey Jr. I just don't like the character of Tony Stark. The initial uh, movie starts out really kind of uh, kind of slow when he's in you know Iraq and everything like that, but it picks up fairly quickly. It's kind of a good origin story, I guess you could say. But it's it's lower on my list of these movies. Um, it doesn't really do that much for me. I would actually put it at the bottom of my list of the films. Yeah, it'd probably be at the bottom for me. Um, now the second film would actually be my not would be the the one I've watched the least, but probably my I would also say my second lowest in the franchise, um, in in the series, which is The Incredible Hulk. Which I actually the only one I didn't know the director offhand. I had to look it up. It was uh, Louis L- Leterrier. Um, and uh, I've never heard of him. I don't know anything else he's done. But I, I thought it was a, definitely an improvement on top of the Ang Lee Hawk, which everyone I, everyone can agree was just a complete misstep. I can't agree because I haven't seen it. So You've never seen Ang Lee's Hawk? No, oh, I've it, heard so many bad things about it that I just I never got around to seeing it. Yeah, I, wish Ang, I think Ang Lee wishes he could forget it as well. But The Incredible Hawk um, was a, a, definitely a step in the right direction. Edward Norton... Uh, definitely st- stepped up and c- d- brought the character to life. Uh, he's an excellent actor. I think he's very underrated. Um, you don't see him too often in, in things anymore. You had Liv Tyler in there, who I'm a fan of, uh, who doesn't do too much you know, work. Uh, we mentioned uh, her in Super, but you know, she doesn't really do much work anymore um, that's real popular. And uh, I think William, William Hurt was in it. Um, and I, I, like, you know, I like William Hurt. There's a good cast again. Great cast in a Tim Roth. But the movie isn't that memorable. There's some great scenes. Um, Hulk smash! Yes, I remember when when the movie came out. You were quite a fan of. I, I was just running around telling everybody Shrek smash. Yeah. Uh, so, but I think the movie, even though it was, it's a, it's enjoyable. I've watched it only twice. It's not the funnest ride. It's it's well made. It's well acted. It's well directed. But I, again, it's kind of just it, it, it's bland. It it doesn't necessarily come across as this epic masterpiece of what the Hulk. You know, it's real. The Hulk is a character that's so challenging to really portray on screen positively and, and, and make, he's complex he's not necessarily because when the, the Hulk story is, to me is more about Bruce Banner than it is about the Hulk yeah and you, get, you do get a lot of that in the, um, the Incredible Hulk with the whole uh, more having to do with Edward Norton and the actual him hulking out and going out and smashing stuff uh, but he's, he's a really hard character to write for I think and I don't know you know, I think he's a hard character in the comic books to read. And if you look at even when he's in the Avengers, he's kind of the character that's kind of pushed to the side a little bit in favor of some of the other characters because he is uh, really hard to read to write for, especially Bruce Banner, and to keep the movie entertaining and exciting. Yeah, they're, they've talked about the new in Age of Ultron, how they're going to try and create finally add a little bit more layer to the the character of the Hulk because again now I'm not particularly a fan of the Hulk I've, even as far as like Marvel animated shows go it's one of my least favorites I, I just the Hulk never stood out as a character that was too entertaining to me I understand why it's popular with a lot of people but again maybe that's why I've only watched it even though I would say it's a better movie that I enjoy it more than Iron Man I've seen Iron Man a few more times um, just because I think it's more of a, a watchable movie even if it's not as good a movie and uh, I would probably put it second lowest on mine as well. Um, going back to uh, when I was a kid, though, and the Lou Ferrigno TV show used to come on, just kind of a little side note story here. When I was a kid, I used to watch that. And there was actually, my mom tells the story, um, or our mom tells the story, about when the episode, you know, when he would come on and Lou Ferrigno would start going. She remembers me saying, you know, my little kid voice, he's hulking out, Mom, he's hulking out. Uh, so just kind of going back to that, but... Uh, you know the Hulk, not really that good of a character. I would put the Incredible Hulk above Iron Man, though, as far as the listing goes of the movies. Yeah. So um, those are the first two. I think you know they were made. In the, they came out in 2008. We didn't get another one in the franchise until um, 2010 when we got Iron Man 2. And 
a lot of people complain that this film was, you know, nothing more than a setup for the Avengers because by this point we it was very clear we were well, going into the Avengers. The uh, the first two movies, real quick. Uh, why was there such a big gap in between those? Was it because you know they were setting up this whole Avengers storyline that they wanted to eventually make? I'm not quite sure. I know when they first put out Iron Man that they were they had the vision of making the Avengers story, but at this point they were unsure. They they were you know they could have fallen flat on their faces. They took a real chance with Iron Man. It was a character you know looking at it now it, it's hard to believe. Oh, how could they not know this was going to be a hit? But they really didn't. No one expected it to do the numbers it did. They were unsure. It was an untested character that wasn't widely known, doesn't have you know the marketability of some of the other characters like Spider-Man or, or the X-Men, um, doesn't have, never had the toy sales, and even in the comic it didn't have the sales that the other ones did. But it came out and it just, it was well made, that Robert Downey Jr. really made the character stand out to a lot of people. Um, we can't underscore how much he liked it. He did it. And so I think when those hit, they they said, okay, we definitely, this is happening. We have the money. We know our vision now. And I think, I don't know for sure. I, I could research it, but I, I don't know for sure. But I would imagine it was because they wanted to, they said they realized it was going to happen and they wanted to put the plans fully in place. Because be, within two years after Iron Man 2, we would be at the Avengers. So at this point, the I think the, the cogs started rolling real real fast and we wanted to get the the, the Avengers machine out because we, we, they knew it was going to be a hit you know I mean it was it cost a fortune to get there but they knew obviously it was the right choice Marvel's got a property now that's worth billions um, so and I think, Iron Man 2 then yeah was that also directed by uh, Farva yeah it was also directed by John Farva who um, if you don't know who he is actually plays his assistant in the movies um, and it brought in as you mentioned earlier Don Cheadle came into the story as um, we uh, moved ahead, we had uh, Mickey Rourke, I believe, was the villain in the film. Sam Rockwell had a good supporting role in it. Scarlett Johansson was brought in, who we would later see play a role in the in the Avengers. Um, so we really started to introduce much more of the overall universe. We had, again, our appearance by Sam Jackson, who we haven't actually mentioned yet, um, who ties all of these films together. The only thing that really ties all of the films together would be Nick Fury. Um, I think I actually like the Avengers, the excuse me, Iron Man two more than I like Iron Man. Um, a lot of people don't. I think partially because they knew closer what they were wanting to do with it. The towards the future, it, it was okay. The, again, this problem it didn't have a strong villain. I don't think that was, I think that was the weakest part of the story, and it was kind of a similar retread of the the same story. You know, them using his suit um, to create weapons. Somebody else wanting to use his suit to create a weapon. So even though it was kind of a retread of the first film. I personally thought it was a funner ride and enjoyed it a lot more. Yeah, and is am I correct in assuming that Iron Man 2 gets a lot of flack, a lot more so than Iron Man 1, right? Oh, yes. Yeah. It's not nearly as popular. Yeah, and that's why that's one of the things that I disagree with the major public on. I think it's a much better film than the first one. Uh, the story seems more uh, straightforward, co cohesive. Uh, there's not a lot of dragging in there, and I didn't think the villains in the first one were that good, so... Whiplash, played by Mickey Rourke in the second one, didn't really, I don't think, hurt the movie or anything like that. Uh, I still put it kind of low because I still do not like the Tony Stark character. But it's uh, it's going to be higher than uh, the Incredible Hulk on my list, higher than the first Iron Man. I'd probably put it the third worst on my list. Um, it just, it's all, the, it really has to come down to the character. I just do not like that character. And it's one of the issues I had with the Avengers too. but we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, these movies and I Iron Man 3 well let's not even get into that but the Iron Man character just it doesn't do anything for me so but the second one was much better than the first one was I think of all three you know it was my favorite of the it, it was my favorite of the Iron Man character in general I may even say I like um, him Tony Stark more in the Iron Man 2 than I liked him as a character in the Avengers um, maybe maybe not we'll get into that later but I think Iron Man 2 while not a masterpiece definitely an improvement in the right step in the right direction and definitely setting up more of the the wider universe you started to see some tributes to um the other characters with captain america's shield app making a little cameo in the in the episode in the movie so i really think that brought out the the, the greater marvel universe and um but these the first three for me they just they're, they're the weaker end of the spectrum i have to say you know moving on to the next film that came out uh, which was which was Thor and opened in May 2011. 
um, I think this is where we really started to cl started clicking. Um, I was this was directed by Kenneth Branagh, who's who's famous as no also known as Mr. Shakespeare. Um, you may know him as Gilderoy Lockhart. You may know him as lots of different characters, but he directed it, and he really I think it really this is where it starts for me. This is and it's it's one of my favorite of it. Thor I think is a great character. It's fun. You had Natalie Portman in there who is just, I mean, again, we're adding more qu quality class actors, Anthony Hopkins, Rene Russo, you know, I mean, I can't preach how much Thor really started the game for me. Yeah, and of, of I think of all the movies, as far as, uh, you know, the Marvel franchise goes, I think the that Thor is probably my favorite in Phase 1, honestly. I think Thor is probably my, my favorite movie of them, of the, of the whole series. Uh, I'm a big fan of Norse mythology, uh, Thor, Loki, uh, you know, Odin, Surtur, all those guys in the Norse, Norse mythology. Uh, I'm really interested in that stuff. And it had a high, um, it was a really sci-fi series, which is something you actually see more of in DC. Um, maybe that's a reason why I like DC more, but you get a lot of that. I thought, um, Hemsworth, is that his name? Hemsworth? Chris Hemsworth. Yes. Hemsworth. I didn't know if I was pronouncing it right. I thought I was, uh, I think he does a good job as Thor. I think that Natalie Portman, she did a good job as well. There was a lot of comedy in the movie uh, with What's-Her-Face. Uh, Kat Denning. Kat Denning, yeah. Uh, there was lots, lots of comedy in the movie. Uh, it felt like you know a fun ride. Loki was a great villain. He's probably the best villain. I guess that's why they used him in the Avengers because he played, you know, of all the Phase 1 movies, he was far and away the best villain in the whole thing yeah he kind of exploded just like Iron Man did when I you know when Iron Man came out everyone was in love with Tony Stark when Thor came out it wasn't about Thor it was all about Loki and how great he that character was how evil and com he, he's complex not only that is he complex he really stand, he's the first time Marvel really and I would still say uh, argued the only time so far that Marvel has had a great villain um, in their franchises in their films and he does an amazing performance he he stands out. Yeah, and then you also get uh, Urgis Elba. He's great in that movie. Oh yeah, as um what's his name? The Watcher. Um I can't Yeah, I don't know it. why. I I was trying to think of his name too. I I was I lost it. I remember the actor's name, but I don't remember the character's name. Uh but he's the keeper of the uh, Rainbow Bridge. Uh he does a great job. I think just kind of I, I do like the second Thor better than the first one. Heimdall. Heimdall. That there we go. I do like the second Thor movie better than the first one, but I think of Phase 1, Thor uh, is definitely my top pick in the whole franchise. While I can't agree with you on that, I think, w yes, w uh, we can't sing the praise of this enough. The great, For one, it had the great villain. The, the biggest problem, I would say, with the film is that it, it doesn't play... You know, you're supposed to have a formula when you're watching an action film. You start with your first, your opening action sequence should be you know large and entice and then every action sequence you know, should play into a certain pattern that builds towards this conclusion. And I think the biggest problem I had with Thor was that it kind of did that wrong. Its best action sequence was the very first action sequence against the Frost Giants, um, and the end action sequence uh, just really didn't cut it for me. I, I don't think it, you know, any of it, the part with the sacrifice, the biggest part of the problem with the movie is if you think about it on a larger scale, yes, his, his great personal change happens over the course of a weekend you know it's like literally two three days and he had he goes from being this spoiled brat to this understanding guy now while i felt this is a flaw i think they did a good job of overseeing it in the movie by the the way they presented the character the way the story played out um and you feel that it was a natural step for him to do that that his character grew and changed even though it wasn't such a short period of time and uh you know as big of an action fan as i am the i i didn't really the action in this movie, although it wasn't great, didn't take me out of the movie or anything like that. There's definitely plenty of other movies that have better action. But I really like the the story of this one. Like I said, the science fiction aspects. I thought the um, the whole Norse mythology thing was great. The acting was really good as well. A lot of humor. Uh, and that kind of, all that stuff kind of made up for, you know, the lack of the big bombastic action scenes. Yeah, I think the action is the worst part of the film. I think the cast this probably has the strongest of the cast. Um, every member of the cast, I think, is is fantastic. The set design, the costumes, every, every part of the film production is well done. Uh, you know, I would have liked to have seen a little bit more Asgard. We would get that later in the in the second film, um, which is very good because that was some of my favorite parts of it. 
Um, but yeah, I think this film, and it, and, I, and it gets a little bit of flack. I think a lot of people, it's not as popular as it should be, in my opinion. It didn't perform as well at the theater as your Iron Man movies would. It didn't really stand well, out. Well, that also had to do with when it came out. It came out in November, I believe, or December. Uh, and usually those movies don't hit nearly as big. You know, the holiday season's big, but it's not nearly as big as your summer blockbusters. Yeah, I mean, well... That that does have a thing to do with that. I don't necessarily agree with that because, you know, you'll see this year we're going to have um, our biggest movie will be Mockingjay. That's pretty much a given, um, which opens in but Twilight. But typically they're not as big. Typically they, they, can, they don't be. You get more of the blockbusters in the summer. And I think it would – I think the character's age, we saw that by the increase of the um, – the revenue increase of the second film, which obviously showed that people so liked the character, and, and maybe that had to do with Loki, um, and the way he with Avengers, the what he brought to that film as well. Um, but I think I think if you haven't if you don't enjoy this one as much as some of the Iron Mans, you you maybe you're not looking at it the same way we are. We're looking at it as more of a science fiction film and less of a Marvel film, uh, more of what it does around a grander scale than what it does as part of you know the this this individual marvel universe um so unless you have everything anything else to say about thor we'll move on to uh the next movie that came out which would be uh captain america captain america would probably be third on my list of these marvel movies uh i think actually the first 45 minutes of captain america uh when he's actually um you know before he gets the injections and everything like that and becomes captain america uh, i think are the best movie making in the entire phase one of Marvel. Uh, I don't think there's that. It hit me on an emotion level on a, uh, you know, so many different levels. There's hardly any action at all involved in it, but it's far and away the best written of the entire series. Uh, I agree. I think Captain America is hands down my favorite of phase one and possibly my favorite Marvel film. I, I'd have to, do a compare and contrast with with Guardians to see which one I actually enjoy more. Um, but Captain America, I think, is so. I don't necessarily agree that it's the best thing they've ever done. That forty five minutes, though, that is my favorite part of the movie. And that is, as I said, this is my my favorite of the the Phase One and possibly all Marvel movies. Um, I think the the second half of the film is just as strong as soon as he becomes Captain America. Captain America is hands down my favorite of the Marvel superhero characters. Um, the ideas he represents, the his morals, the compassion he has, everything about him that speaks to the quality of what it means to be a, a good person, a person who's willing to stand up for what's right, um, the, kind of the person we should all aspire to be, somebody who has the strength to stand up for it and say, though I, it doesn't matter if I'm big, if I'm small, I'm going to do the right thing. And it, it kind of, same thing kind of goes with my, you know, the reason I love Superman are because of the reasons you just stated. And I think that Captain America is the Marvel equivalent of Superman. Uh, and that makes him the most endearing character and the best hero. Whereas, you know, Iron Man is like the antithesis of that. Uh, Captain America is what I like to see in my heroes. Yeah, you know, I think you can also say, we can argue that the Iron Man, Captain America dynamic would be the Batman Superman dynamic. Um, we'll, we'll go into that in, in, the, in a little the next bit movie. About, um, obviously, that's going to be the main to topic since we keep mentioning it. Um, but I think the first Captain America film, you get Tommy Lee Jones gives a great performance as the general. He's really well. He um, does really well. Stanley Tucci as the German scientist who comes up with and his reasonings on why he created this um, and why he chose Steve Rogers. Wonderful. Again, playing into that first 45 minutes you're talking about. Hallie Atwell does such a great job. Obviously, there's a reason she's getting her own TV show um, that I am personally extremely excited for and more excited for than... Probably, you know, the next I was I'm more excited for this than I was for Captain America, the the second movie. And I loved Captain, as I'm stating, I love Captain America. So um, I like the way the 1942 aspect gives it separates it from all the other Marvel films as well um, and creates this kind of fictitious background that the Marvel Universe is, all, you know, sending the Marvel Universe back to this isn't a recent thing. These occurrences have been part of our world said, so, you know, just like Thor mentions. Um, back when they visited back a thousand years ago, this universe, this bigger universe, has always been part of the world, and I, I just think it, it's going to age well better than the other films, um, simply because the the time period it takes place in is dated. It's meant to have this kind of glossed over look, um, while the action again wasn't super amazing as it could be. Um, it was much better than Thor and much better than some of the other movies, I think. Um, and I think it stands out. I don't understand why it doesn't get more love. Yeah, and. Uh... I don't really want to 
talk ad nauseum here about how much you know I dislike Iron Man and uh, Captain America so we'll just kind of move on to the Avengers and kind of discuss the Avengers uh, this was the movie that uh, was hugely successful the most successful of all of the Marvel movies um, including Guardians of the Galaxy Yes. Oh, much better. Well, Guardians is only the, um, I think, third highest grossing um, behind Iron Man 3. Yeah. So, I mean, the Avengers just, like, that's all I heard about for months when it came out was the Avengers this and the Avengers that. We brought back, uh, we had a new Incredible Hulk in uh, Mark Ruffalo. We got um, uh, Robert Downey Jr. coming back. We got uh, Chris Hemsworth coming back. We got Chris Evans, our... uh, Human Torch. He came back to play Captain America, um, and then we've got we got Loki back as well, and Nick Fury kind of tied everything together too. How uh, funny that you didn't mention Black Widow and um, Hawkeye. Yeah, they're boring. Uh, you know, I I think um, yeah, and, uh, Jeremy Renner played. If you count the screen time, he was much less than the other characters. I was he had a, we didn't even mention his cameo in Thor. That's how insignificant I feel the character is. And they they did mention they're going to amp. Uh, him up a little bit more in the new one, so let's hope he his character comes. Why a don't they more. just give him his own movie? I'm surprised they haven't, to be quite honest. But uh, they got other stuff on their plate right He's now. He's Marvel's version of uh, the Green Arrow, anyway. So yeah, he, there's nothing. You, you know, let, yeah, just watch Arrow, the TV show, if you really care about anything like that character. I think um, while the movie is amazing, it has the best action sequences of any of the films. Um, the first 45 minutes are a little dry. Um, I do still love it. I love that Captain America is the main focus of the film, if you think about it. I read a count of all who spends the most time on screen of all the heroes um, down to the seconds, and by like a minute, it is Captain America ahead of Iron Man, and that made me very happy, because I feel he is. there's a reason he's the leader of the Avengers. Um, and Yeah, when, you, when you've got a hero that's that, that moral... Uh, that moral statue that you look up to and and uh, kind of awe and model yourself after that's the obvious choice that's why uh, for the most part superman is the leader of the justice league kind of there really isn't too much of a leader but he's kind of the guy that's the moral compass that everybody looks to Um, same thing with captain america and i'm glad that he got more screen time than tony stark did in this movie although i think the reason i kind of put avengers second on my list behind thor uh, if I'm going to be listing him, is that uh, there was just too much Tony Stark in it, and he really, really got on my nerves in this film. Uh, the way him, the conversations with him and Captain America, it just kind of rubbed me the wrong way. And that's, you know, the action, like you said, is great. Um, the story's pretty good. Loki's a great villain. Uh, and that's kind of the reason I put it up at number two uh, behind Thor. As uh, it's just that Tony Stark element brings it down a little bit for me. Yeah, it doesn't flow as well of a, as flow as well of a movie as a lot of the other ones. I think. Um, I think the reason it did so well was obviously because I mean the uh, the chance to finally see all these people coming together. We've watched all these movies building up to this. Um, I mean, we knew it was going to be a success. We and it was it was just it was a miracle that it came out so well. That jo- I mean, you had Joss Whedon doing a great job. You, when you knew it was in his hands, you knew he was going to take care of it. Um, having been on set and getting to yeah, meet- uh, you forgot to make you got to mention here that you were actually in and well, on the set of the Avengers. Yeah, I, I was on set. I got to. I had two experiences on set. One as a visitor, um, in which case I got to watch them film a scene with Chris Evans, and um, it was you know it's a fl- you see it for a second in the movie. It's a flash scene. Um, where Captain America, you see uh, old footage of Captain America during World War II that Tony Stark is looking at on some little pad, and that's all it is. And that was the scene I saw. It was they spent you know an hour setting it up and filming it for like half a second on screen. Not even it's it's not even part of the screen. It's an image somewhere on the screen, um, and that was great. I got to meet Joss Whedon, talk to him for a moment, um, and then I had to actually due to this, I had the chance to be an extra by some of the people I met, uh, my my contacts that I met through this. And got a chance to be on set and film a scene in the as a shield a member of Shield on the helicarrier. Um, you can't actually see me in the film, as far as I can tell, um, which is fine. I had the great experience of, of being on it. Um, but yeah, you can tell why the movie would go on to be this success because how what are the chance you would ever get to see all these heroes together? Um, you know, now we obviously have Superman versus Batman trying to play catch up and, and mark it on the the bringing. I mean, it's the Alien versus Predator, or the Freddy versus Jason. You're bringing everybody together. How how could it not be a, a, an event? And we built, we spent, what is it, 2008 to 2012? How many years did it take us to get there? Um, so I think, 
while it is fun and it is great as a movie it doesn't it's not as watchable necessarily as some of the other ones just because it is more of an event film than an actual cohesive storyline yeah, and so that kind of i mean puts an end to our phase one discussion if i was to order them i've already talked to the order but i'll give you the order right now uh so last on my list is going to be iron man uh then going to go to the incredible hulk iron man 2 then go with Captain America, the Avengers, and number one on my list is going to be Thor. Uh, yeah, my list would actually uh, be pretty similar to yours, but uh, uh, Captain America is my number one, hands down, no doubt. Um, and then beyond that, I would just probably put switch my Avengers and my um, Thor with yours. So I would put um, the Thor number two um, and Avengers down one lower. So um, that would be my list with those, obviously, the Iron Man 2, the Incredible Hulk, and the first Iron Man rounding it out at the bottom. And, you know, I, I really think that uh, Phase 2 was much much improvement. I can't wait till next year when we finish it and we can discuss that um, after Age of Ultron comes out and move on to, you know, the, the bigger universe Phase 3. I mean, we'll keep going. we got years' worth of material here to talk about. And they're going to do years' worth of material. No, like, it till it's dry. All right. So uh, that's our discussion on Phase 1 of the Marvel Universe. Uh, you probably don't agree, as, like I said, most people don't agree with our assessments of movies. Um, but this is our opinion, so... From here, we're going to go from something that's immensely popular to something that you probably never heard of in Mr. Joshua's Tea Time. So, Josh, take it away. Tea Time! <laughs> tea Time! That's right. Uh, we're going to start with, we're going to go with something a little different this week, something you probably haven't heard of. But before I get into that, I'm going to tell you about my tea this week. It is um, from a local place here in Albuquerque uh, called the St. James Tea Room. It's not one of my favorite blends, but it's I was kind of running low on stuff. I need to restock, and it's called Morning and Giverney. It's a traditional black. Um, it's not much to it than that. It's kind of straight straight tea. There's not much flavoring on it. Um, but my topic this week for tea time is going to be a band I'm a huge fan of, huge, huge fan of. Uh, they're called Carcass. Um, I don't really want to label them with the genre. They're a metal band. That's as simple as I'll label them um, from the U.K. Uh, they started in the late 80s. I'm um, going to talk about some of their albums and their different styles. They, they, they varied a lot of styles. They created a lot of genres. Um, it's very extreme music. And well, it started off very extreme, came a little less extreme, and then went back to being a little more extreme. But uh, before we get into it, let's hear your thoughts. Um, yeah, you've always tried to push Carcass on me. Uh, and unfortunately, I haven't been too accepting of them. Uh, the earlier albums are kind of hard to listen to, um, but the later album isn't too bad. Uh, it's just, it's not my cup of tea. I like your choice of words there. Um, so we're, we're, let me talk about their first album, because when they started, they were definitely, um, their first album is their most unapproachable. The name of the album is The Reek of Putrefaction, um, and it's, it's, it's very extreme music. Um, there was a three-piece three piece band at this point. Uh, it was just bit, Ken Owen on drums. Bill Steer on guitar and um, Jeff Walker on bass and vocals. Uh, all three of them did vocals at this point, actually. And uh, it's very unapproachable. It's very harsh to listen to. The album has uh, 35 tracks and is less than, I think it's only like 35 minutes long, 40 minutes long, something like that. It, it, it's not, or excuse me, it only has 22 tracks, but it's only like 35 minutes long. Um, and it's just, it's not very, it's very hard to get to with songs like um, Carbonized Eye Sockets and micro microwave utero gestation um it's ex it's a little extra it's definitely extreme metal um it's my least favorite hands down of the albums um are you familiar with this album at all uh it, the recording production on it is really bad i never listened to it maybe more than once or twice uh i'm not familiar with it at all yeah it's um it's really bad production um the only songs i really like on the album um would be um, Genital Grinder, which is an instrumental opening track, and Burn to a Crisp. Those are the only two songs I really, really enjoy of them. But it really didn't stand out to me. Um, and then it, it moved on to um, their second album, Symphonies of Sickness, um, which definitely started to become a little more straightforward metal, though it still held on to some of those more extreme, um, as the title would go, Gore Grind. Um, the genre they pretty much created and perfected on this album um, was definitely a breakout album for them. It was still a three-piece at this, at this point, at this juncture. And I think this album really had some standout tracks. Exhumed to Consume is still their most popular track. Um, the band Exhumed has gotten their name from this. A lot of bands have taken on this style with the, the deep vocals, the deep guttural, and then the higher pitched vocals. Um, this album really stood out as a landmark album. A lot of bands would, would take on this style, and there's a reason the term Carcass Ripoff um, exists in the, in the metal universe, because they created this genre, pretty much. And they 
Well, not, some would say they didn't perfect it. I think this album stands out. Do you know any of this, the tracks on this album at all? I, I have no clue. It's, it, it's about the same as the first album, a little bit better production, but the songs just, they just don't do it for me. That gore grind sound, I'm not really into at all. Yeah, they started to add a little more, um, little more melody in the songs. It's not as extreme, and I think this album... Could, you could start to see the beginnings of the direction the band was going, but it was a big shift from the first album, and I think the, the next album after it was even more of a big shift. You see this gradual change of the band, and I think this is the first album that states it. The, the way they changed and evolved from their first album to this one, I think would, would stand out throughout the rest of their albums as we moved on um, to their next album, which is probably my personal favorite, um, which if I pronounce this wrong, I apologize, it's Necroticism, Discanting, Dechanting, um, the insa, Insalubrarius, or something like that. I'm I always pronounce it wrong. I just call it necrotism, necroticism, I believe it's actually pronounced. Um, and this album was here is, in my opinion, their landmark. It was the best mix of their sounds. Um, it, they still had the more extreme gore grind sound, but they were starting. They added a, another guitarist, Michael Lamont, who would um, go on to have fame in, in his own way in other bands. And I think this album really um, defined the, the direction the band was going. They now had two guitar players that had a lot of guitar soloing and harmonies. Um, but it still was really ferocious and aggressive. I mean, you still had a lot of lyrical concepts that were medical and very disturbing um, to go along with their imagery. Songs with names like Pedigree Butchery and um, Incarnated Solvent Abuse, obviously continuing the same lyrical themes. You very had, you had lyrics that didn't really repeat a lot, but I think this album is, is my favorite probably from the band. And uh, that one, uh, it's a little bit more approachable because I don't like the gore grind sound, but I do like the Swedish melodic sound that they were going to in the later albums. Uh, but it's still just, I mean, every every album I'm going to go into, probably the only one I like is the last one. So I, I, it's not my thing. Okay. Well, moving on, this at that point they were starting to break out and had become really big. Well, not really big, really big in the metal scene at least. Um, and their next album they would, be, would take a huge shift for them. Um, it was called Heartwork. It had a uh, artwork by H.R. Giger, and it definitely they started. They dropped the um, lyric, the gory lyrics. They lost the Bill Steers vocals, which were very deep and guttural, um, and Jeff Walker's vocals were cleaned up a little bit. You had um, vocals that were repeated, that were easy and cut. The songs were a lot more catchy. This was a straightforward. Um, Swedish melodic album, and I think this was this album came out the same year um, as the other landmark album, which is a little more aggressive. At the Gates is um, Slaughter of the Soul, and I think these two albums really define the styles of the Swedish melodic genre. And I mean, some of the song, I mean, song titles you're looking at this are, are more like Blind Leading the Blind and Buried Dreams, No Love Lost, songs that are much more mainstream and approachable to somebody a little less extreme. And this is the sound that I more that I prefer more from Carcass, the Swedish Melodic. I'm a big Swedish Melodic fan. Uh, I do like Arch Enemy with Michael Amott, and he kind of, his chops and his songwriting ability kind of came out in this album. So this album is definitely a lot more accessible than their first three to me. Well, we'll argue over whether who influenced who and who changed who styles. Um, that's an argument for another day, but I think, you know, this album, what people felt was a real shift in their style, and it would continue on their next album, their last album before the band broke up, um, which is called Swan, Swan Song. Um, Happily titled. Yeah, kind of unusual. And um, an interesting album because the band was signed, um, was released from Earache, the record company they were on, and was picked up by Columbia, um, which is a very mainstream label. And w it was recommended that they try taking, you know, vocal lessons, that Jeff Walker take vocal lessons, singing lessons. And they just, you could see the band changing its style a lot. It's very much more um, relaxed chill music and very more rock and roll the band Bill Steer as a guitar player was leading away from metal and looking more towards uh, rock in general hard rock and classic rock and so I mean and you saw more songs that were just fun like Black Star and Child's Play that just were kind of easygoing rock the votes kind of lyrics at this point have become a little different more um, social or, you know about what it was like to be you know living and, and human being um, but I think this album gets a lot of flack, and I actually enjoy this album quite a bit. It's not as met I would barely call it a metal album, but I think it's a, a great album. I know this is the one that has the song, some of the songs that you liked on it. Yeah, this one was probably of the um, their first five albums, their first time in uh, making these. It was probably the most accessible and easy for me to kind of get into. Like I said, I do like the whole Swedish melodic sound, and you get a lot more of this. They kind of continued this on from Heartwork and brought it into this new one as well. Probably my favorite of the first five albums. 
Yeah, and then this, you know, at this point the band kind of dissolved. Um, Bill Steward completely lost his interest in metal. He moved on and created um, Firebird, um, which would be it was a kind of a blues rock trio band, um, very inspired by 70s bands like Cream and stuff like that, um, which I think is okay. I own a little bit of it. Um, Jeff Walker and Ken Owen would go on and try and continue with the band in a similar style, very similar to what Swan Song was with a band called Black Star Rising, um, which they added. Um, kept Carlos, the guy who would replace Michael Amon on Swan Song. They kept Carlos Regalos, I think his name is. Chep Chelios. Chep Chelios. Um, no, and they added a, a guitar player from, I believe it was Cathedral. And I thought I really liked the, uh, the Black Star Rising album. I really felt like it was a, a similar carcass. But then the band kind of, you know, had disappeared and they had gone away. And it would be a long time. It would take until um, last year, actually, before we would get a new album from the band. Unfortunately, Ken Owen couldn't be part of it. He had a brain aneurysm. Um, but their new album, Surgical Steel, which was a, a landmark comeback album, it was well received um, by fans and critics alike, um, came out last year, and it really brought the band back to the forefront. It was a continuation. Some people said it was more of a mix of sounds and styles between the third and the album that should have taken place between um, Necroticism and Heartwork. And I kind of agree with that statement for the most part that it it, it has more of an aggressive nature than Heartwork did, but is definitely more. Um, Swedish melodic and toned down than something like Necroticism is not isn't nearly as aggressive. And I really loved the album. It was one of, it tied for my album of the year last year. I thought it was amazing, and I was so glad to finally get it and hopefully get them some more albums. What are, what are your thoughts on that, their new one? Uh, well, I actually kind of do like the new one. It's not it's not as good in my opinion. Or, well, it's actually probably better than uh, everything else that they've done. Uh, but it's just. It's an album I can listen to and enjoy. It's just not an album that I can get into and be like, you know, obsessed about and stuff like this. And always throwing it in my CD player um, or these days playing it on my iTunes. Uh, it's a pretty good album. It's not great in my opinion, but it's pretty good. And so that's that's my thoughts on Carcass. Um, if you like metal at all, maybe give them a, a check out. Um, maybe you've heard of them. Um, if not, uh, if it's not your thing, then I uh, hope I didn't feel you don't feel I wasted your time. Um, my movie of the week, my pick of this week, is actually the first Best Picture winner, one of only two silent films to win Best Picture. It came out in 1927. Uh, stars Claire Bow. Uh, it's called Wings. It's about a, a couple of World War II fighter pilot, World War One, excuse me, fighter pilots, and it's fantastic. You should check it out. All set. Okay. What are you doing in my swamp? And welcome to another installment of Shrek Swamp. Uh, today I'm going to be actually going a little bit different and going into the board game realms. Uh, board game realm. If you come into our house, you will uh, eventually play board games. We've got a whole closet full of them, and I really wish we've got this one that I'm going to be talking about, Axis and Allies. Um, it's one that I really, really enjoy, but nobody else in the house ever wants to play it. Uh, well, on occasion they do want to play it, but everybody kind of gives me a lot of guff when I do want to play it. I was going to say, you better not. You're talking to the, the you mentioned our closet of board games, whose most of those are mine. I was going to say, I'm, I'm always down. The problem is nobody else, and it takes a while to play. So don't, don't go uh, saying I'm not down to play, because I enjoy the game just as much as you do. It's just a little time consuming, that's all. Yeah, it is a, it is a really fun game. I'm into the more strategy type games. And Axis and Islands, forget about Risk. If you're going to play a board game about like you know battles and wars and stuff like that, Axis and Allies is the way to go. Like you mentioned, it does take a long time to play. I remember the first time we tried to play a board game when I was in the Air Force. We started out in uh, eight hours. We'd only completed three turns of the game. So it does take a long time to play. Yeah, and I mean, first off, the initial setup of the game itself is a large portion of that. The first round going through um, takes much... Each round, I would consecutive round, I would say, gets a little faster than the previous rounds as the game begins to move. But those first few rounds definitely are very slow when you get it. I've, I spent remember spending uh, four hours playing one round of a game because people didn't know how to play the game and we were, had to, we were having to teach them. Yeah, initially it does take a long time if you're just learning. Um, it's one of the board games you should pick a spot to set it up and uh, just leave it there so you can kind of go back to it and play it every now and then, you know, do a little a little extra turn or whatever. Um, it's not something that you could probably play in one sitting. But it was, uh, it came out in 1981. Uh, it was created by Larry Harris, I think. Um, and he created the game uh, as a kind of more advanced, kind of World War II-ish Risk type battle game. And uh, the big difference between Risk is, you know, in Risk you have this global domination. It's kind of medieval and stuff like that. You have individual units, and that's it, one unit. 
um, the nice thing that Axis and Allies did was that it incorporated a lot of different units. So uh, all the kinds of World War II ones that you see, you have infantry, tanks, fighter planes, bombers, uh, you have industrial production, that's a big part of the game. You also have submarines, aircraft carrier, transports, battleships. So it's a game that incorporates a lot of different aspects of World War II and kind of a nice little strategy game that you can sit and enjoy. Uh, I think you also forgot uh, another important thing that, that was realistic, uh, research, developing new new weapons to try and try and take a, an advantage in the war, try and move up ahead and, and get that, that extra lead on your, your opponent. Well, that actually wasn't in the actual first game the Axis and Allies Classic, it came in afterwards. There are a lot of different versions of it out there. Um, you know, there's Axis and Allies Classic, there's Axis and Allies... Um, uh, 1942, I think, isn't that the 1942, one? 1942. That's the one we own. 1941, there's Axis and Allies D-Day, there's Axis and Allies Europe. Ax there's a whole bunch of different versions of the game. They all have the same basic gameplay, but there's just a lot of differences in the uh, time period that you're in or the area of the world that you're in that they've created um, and they've really created a nice franchise in the Axis and Allies. Yeah, they've even started to expand outside of World War II. I, I know they have um, a World War One game. I know they're, I, I'm not positive, but I think they have another one from a different era, like Vietnam or something like that. I'm not positive on that though, but I know there's different versions um, outside that even extend outside of World War II. Yes, they're, they're starting to kind of branch out and they've got a little miniatures, ga miniatures game now and everything. Um, there's about 11 board games in the series and uh, it's just it, the series has kind of evolved over the years but uh, the original idea and the classic version you basically play as five different countries so one player will be the US one player will be the UK one player will be Russia and then that'll be on the Allies side and then on the Axis side one player will be Germany and another player will be Japan so that's kind of the basic structure of the original game and they've kind of added on to that and the the worldwide game there's like they've added China and Italy into it as well but the initial version only had the five countries and you can play those with a number of different players uh, two players one is Axis one is Allies you can play it as um, three players one is Germany one is Japan the other one is the Allies or you can kind of mix and match however you want or you can just have all five people one being each country although it does kind of suck for the player playing Russia because their gameplay isn't really fun at all. That's the one thing you mentioned about the game. There is a certain, you have to have a certain style of gameplay. You have to know, understand the way the war was fought. You actually have to know a little bit about the history of how the war was fought and the way each country's strength, where each country's strengths lie and where their, their weaknesses lie and play the game to that. And I think that's one of the, you know, some people would say that's a, you know, a distractor because you have to play it a certain way, but I think that adds a certain element of what makes it such a special game. It's based on reality. It's a game that's meant to, while still be a game and can have any outcome, you play, you've got to play to each country's strengths. Yes, and like one of the strengths for Russia, who's not really very fun, is just building up lots and lots of infantry to combat the oncoming onslaught that um, Germany is going to be allowing, you know, it's going to be bringing on you. And then you've got the whole Africa campaign. You can participate in that. Um, the way the game is set up, you start out the game when the Axis are at the height of their powers. So the Axis has the initial advantage. Um, I love playing as the Axis. Um, I think they're the most fun to play as. Germany, Japan is easily the best t uh, country to play in the game, but Germany's pretty fun as well, uh, and I love playing both of them at the same time. The one thing that you have to kind of uh, get around, the kind of the rule about it is, you know, Axis has the advantage early, like I just stated, but as the game progresses, the longer it goes on, the Allies start to take up, you know, their production starts to take over Germany and Japan, and they start to move a little bit forward, just like what happened in World War II. Yeah, and I think that's what makes it such a challenge, is when you play as the Axis, I think that's why you enjoy playing them so much, is the, the struggle as the game goes on to try and defeat, because you're the ones now who are, who are in control, so you have to hold on to it, whereas the other ones are trying to build up, you know, because the U.S. starts with that, if starts with that since they're so separated they start with all that great production um they it's this you know build towards this battle that you have to prepare for the other side has the advantage of and i think that's why you like the axis i like personally playing the allies to be quite honest just because i like the challenge of trying to build and if you take too long to build you go to, or you you go too fast um it, it can really greatly affect the outcome you have to especially as usa which is probably my favorite country to play as 
um, because you have to struggle to get over there quickly, but not too quickly. You don't want to go over there and without enough force. And I think that's that's what makes my one is the the, the struggle to find the balance of time. Yes, and uh, you have to kind of take it like you said about you know knowing the history of World War Two and stuff like that. You kind of have to take it like that. You know, USA they're the most powerful allies. They need to build up their stuff to help out the other allies. If the U.S. spends all of its time in the United States just doing their little thing, um, you're never going to, uh, you're end up going to end up losing the game because the U.K. and Russia cannot hold out against Germany and Japan. That's just not the way it is. So Germany needs to advance very quickly. The U.S.A. needs to get over and help its allies as soon as it can. Yeah, but bringing it back to the gameplay of the game, I think um, I think for some people it is a little too complex. That may be a problem. You have to really be dedicated to the game. And I think that's the greatest strong suit. We own a lot of games that are a little more challenging. And I, since I love playing games, I like devoting a little more time and thought to my games. And this one requires definitely more, in my opinion. And I don't know if it's for everyone, um, but I definitely enjoy it. And I wish we could play it more. Yeah, the only real thing is I know some people don't like dice games. There is a heavy um, reliance on dice, but there is a lot of strategy involved in it. And in fact... Uh, the rule book, I've, there's a basic rule book, and a few years ago when I got the board game as a gift, I had already been playing it years and years and years on the computer. You can download it for free, just the board game. Uh, it is a torrent site, but you can get it onto your computer. Uh, it, the gameplay goes a lot quicker. But uh, when I got the board game, I spent a long time writing my own rules and everything like that. Uh, I never actually finished them, but I was up to like almost 40 pages of rules. Um, so it's a definitely a very heavy strategy game with a little bit of luck and dice rolls and stuff like that in it. But it is, I mean, it's a really fun game if you like those type of games, the, the in-depth strategy kind of thing. Um, I've looked at websites that have tons and tons of initial strategies for each country, and they kind of tell you what you can do here, what you can do there, that kind of stuff. So if you're into that type of game, uh, I would definitely go check it out. Remember, it does take a long time to play. You might want to start out with that um, online version or the version you can download on your computer and play that. Um, the AI isn't very good, but it can kind of give you an idea of what to expect from the board game. Oh uh, yeah, my only negative thought on the the game is sometimes, as we said, stated, it goes, it takes a long time. Sometimes it, I wish it could go longer. It's a game where you kind of think, it, in some ways, it's because of the gameplay you want it to to move a little slower and. And when you get into, you know, eight hours in, ten hours in, and you're finishing your game, twelve hours, however long it takes you to play your game, um, you're kind of sad that it's ending, and, and it's sad that you have to restart it. So I wish it had a little bit more like a continuing aspect like that, um, but that's not the kind of game it is. That's It's a, it's a one-and-done game, and then you play, you start it up, and you play you can play different ways. You can play as, you know, Japan and, and the U.S. versus the other three countries, or however you want to play. That's the one aspect that I guess keeps it fresh as well, though. Yeah, and you can actually do that on the video game version as well. So that's my thoughts on um, my Shrek Swamp um, Axis and Allies this week. Um, so what do we have today for our final countdown? It's the final countdown! And this is our final countdown for our fifth episode here. Uh, tonight we're going to be doing top five dream cars. Now they don't necessarily have to be cars. They can be vans, trucks, anything like that. Um, but they're kind of like the dream cars that we see on uh, TV or any real ones that we wanted to do. Um, what do you have? Anything? Do you have anything to say? Yeah, about I, I didn't include motorcycles in mine. Um, I did have. I would have if um, if we were talking vehicles in general. Um, I would have also thought about boats and stuff. But I didn't want to include that. But yeah, I agree. I went with the same thing: vans, cars, um, different type, anything that, in my opinion, was a car um, that could be any, a, a four-wheeled vehicle like that. Um, so my number five that I start with is the Oscar Mayer Wiener truck. I don't think I need to say anything more. If you don't, if you know what the Oscar Mayer Wiener truck is, you know how awesome it is. Yeah, it'd be pretty cool to cruise around the city in that. Uh, my number five is going to be the DeLorean from Back to the Future Part Two, with the flying car. You get the flying, you get the time travel. Um, the car's pretty ugly, but uh, yeah, how can you go wrong with the DeLorean? Yeah, it's like a weaker TARDIS or something like that. You know, it can pretty much do do it all. Um, my number four is going to be, I don't know if it has an official name, I think they call it the RV from Hell in um, uh, what's called um, Tango, and, Tango Cash. and Cash. Excuse me, I had a brain fart there. Um, Tango and Cash, It's it, I, there's not much to say about it. It's an attack vehicle. It, it looks like an RV. It has weapons. It's bulletproof. It, it looks just like fun. They, go, see, go see Tango and Tango Cash. Tango Cash. It stood out for me as a child. 
All right, so my number four is going to be the APC or a armored personnel carrier from the Aliens movie. I always thought this was just like a, an awesome piece of machinery when I was a kid and still as an adult. Uh, my favorite action movie of all time. I love seeing that uh, APC rolling around and everything like that. Yeah, I, I can't believe I missed that one from my list. It, it barely made it, but it is, it is a great car. Uh, my number three is a car that I really wouldn't want to own, but it's Herbie. And who couldn't resist the idea of owning a car that was alive and could take care of you and do amazing things? So that, I had to pick that one as my number three. My number three is going to be the Black Beauty from uh, the Green Hornet series. It's actually going to uh, pick the one from the 1960s television show with Van Williams and Bruce Lee. Yeah, my uh, number two... Um, is a Johnny Cab from Total Recall. Um, it has a automatic driver. Uh, it's more. It's a taxi basically with a computerized driver that talks to you and is voiced by Robert Picardo. Hey, how can you, yeah, you can't go wrong with Robert Picardo. Uh, my number two goes all the way back to my childhood when I loved the A Team. And there's nothing really special about the vehicle. It doesn't have any weapons or anything like that. But the A Team van has always stood out as one of my dream cars that I always wanted to own. And we come to our number one, and I had to go with. It took me a hard time. It took me a while to get this one. It was a hard choice, but I went with the M50 Urban Assault v- Vehicle, um, the, basically the RV from the movie Stripes, um, which is a giant, a moving tank that is also doubles as an RV. And my number one is going to be uh, the last of the V8 interceptors from the movie The Road Warrior, Mad Max trilogy. Uh, still, every time I watch that car, I'm just like, I, I just fall in love with it, and I, it's really sad when it actually gets destroyed. Uh, it will be out again next year in the new Mad Max movie, but uh, that'd be my number one. So there you have it. That's our our top five for this week. Um, we hope you enjoyed the episode. Next week we'll be featuring some uh, some other topics. What are we having next week? Well, actually, next week we'll be, um, we're going to do James Gunn, director, uh, who's famous for Guardians of the Galaxy. We'll be discussing our guilty pleasure movies, and uh, I'm going to tell you how to survive the zombie apocalypse. See you then. Go away or I shall punch you a second time.